GNU-Octave is a script-based computer programming language primarily aiming at solving algebraic and differential equations. You don't need to compile your computer code to run, so this is one of the biggest advantages over C or R programming languages. So this makes your programming job very easy. It has a numerous built-in functions and there are various plotting capabilities. Also, it allows for developing user-defined functions, so you can develop your own functions. This is a free software and highly compatible with the MATLAB. MATLAB is a powerful commercial scientific computing software, so you can use a GNU Octave as a free alternative to a MATLAB. To install GNU Octave, you can go to this link, then you can download set of file. You can find this link in the description section below. Or you can Google it by typing GNU Octave Download in the search bar and hit OK. Then click the very top list. In download page, bore into Windows tab and download 64-bit installation file and then save it under download folder by hitting save icon. Then you can start downloading it. If you run 32-bit Windows, download 32-bit installation file instead and install. Once you're done, go to the folder that you saved. Here I saved it in the download folder and then double click installation file to install and hit OK with the default setting. If successful, you should be able to see two new icons in the desktop, like a blue ring with the three orange rectangle icons. The difference between these two is a user interface. CLI represents a command line interface and GUI is a graphic user interface. I prefer to use GUI and you can double click to launch Octave. In main GNU Octave window, you have five sub windows. In the central area, we have a command window. On the left side, there are file browser, workspace, and command history. On the right side, we have a variable editor. You can adjust the window size by changing the borderline between the sub-windows. When you move your mouse point to the border, you can see the vertical bar with two arrow-shaped mouse point, and then it is ready to change the sub-window size. For now, I'm going to focus on the command window. In the top part of the command window, you have software version, copyright, and website information for further reading. This version is 4.4.1. Below, there are two consecutive larger than arrows, which we call it command prompt. It follows a blinking cursor, and it means it is ready to take your input. Let's start with a basic calculation. To calculate 2 plus 3, I'm typing 2 plus sign 3 followed by hitting enter key. It does not execute until you hit the enter key. It shows a calculation result which is 5. In Octave, most recent result is automatically saved in a variable ANS. ANS stands for answer. The most recent result can be shown by typing ANS and hitting enter key. We can also type date and hit the enter key. Date is a built-in function to check the today's date. You can see that today's date is 2019, January 17. Again, it is automatically saved in the variable ANS. Remember, we have a numeric number 5 in the ANS previously, but the variable ANS is updated with the new result. You can calculate cosine 0 by typing COS parentheses with 0 in between. You can get 1 as expected. You can type CLC to clear the command window. You can also use home as an alternative. To find detailed information of given built-in function, you can use help followed by the built-in function name. For example, if you want to learn more about cosine function, type help space COS. You can see the functionality and syntax. Below, there is also a list of relevant functions that you may be interested in learning. If you do not know the exact function name and want to search it based on the keyword, you can also use look for as a single word, followed by the keyword of the built-in function. For example, if you want to search all the built-in function having COS as a keyword, type look for space followed by COS. You can see the entire list. 
For example, in the top list, it shows ACOS, which is a function to calculate arc cosine. It computes the inverse cosine in radians for each element of x. Octave also supports basic arithmetic operators. In this table, a and b are the variables or numeric numbers, and arithmetic operators can be used between two variables or numbers. For addition, we use a plus sign. For subtraction, minus sign. For multiplication, we use a star sign, which is given in the above numeric number 8 in the keyboard. For exponentiation, we use a caret if you want to calculate a to the power of b. The caret is given in the above numeric number 6 in the keyboard. Alternatively, you can use double star signs. Simply type two star signs. And for division, use slash sign. To calculate 2 minus 3, you can simply type 2 minus sign followed by 3, and you can see minus 1 as a result. To multiply 2 by 3, you can type 2 star 3 to have 6. To calculate 2 multiplied by 3 and add 1, type 2 star 3 plus 1, and you have 7. If you want to calculate 2 multiplied by 3 plus 1 as a whole, type 2 star open parentheses, 3 plus 1 followed by close parentheses. Then you have 8. This expression means that you add 3 to 1 before you multiply 2. To calculate 2 power of 3, you need to type 2 care 3 or 2 2 star signs 3 to have 8. You choose whichever you prefer. To calculate 3 divided by 2 and 3 slash 2, so you have 1.5. Variables are data storage space for numeric or string values. The string is a basically text. The main benefit of using variables instead of directly using the data themselves is that we can reuse them by calling the variable names when needed. Variable names are typically English alphabet, A to Z, either lowercase or uppercase, or combinations of English alphabet, numeric number, and underscore. Here are a couple of examples for creating variables. In this diagram, my English alphabet A is a variable name and numeric number 2 is the numeric number that I would like to save in the data storage space. I can use B1 as a variable name to hold a numeric number 3. Next, I can use a underscore text as a single word for a variable name to hold octave as string or text values. Let's practice how to create variables. Here is a basic rule to follow to create the variables. First, you need to start with the variable name followed by equal sign. Then type expression afterwards. The expression can be either numeric number, mathematical expression, string, and another variables, or combinations of them. For example, to create a variable a to hold the number 2, you should type a equals sign followed by 2 and hit enter in the command window. If successfully created, it automatically prints a equals 2 below. If you don't want to immediately print, you can use the semicolon at the end of expression, such as a equal to 3 followed by semicolon at the end. So you don't see any result in the screen, but it creates the variable a internally. You can check what data has been saved by simply typing a followed by enter key. If you try to print the variable name that has not been created before, you will get the error message. For example, if you simply type b, which never been used before, and you get an error message as undefined. Octave cannot print the undefined variable. You can also a mathematical expression to create a variable. I would like to create a variable b to assign the result of 1 plus 3 over 2. Type b equals sign followed by 1 plus 3 divided by 2. You can create a variable c by assigning the data given in the existing variable b. To do this, type c equals sign followed by b. Also, you can create a variable d by adding 1 to the existing variable b. To run this operation, you can type d equals sign followed by b plus 1. You can use the same variable in the left and right sides of equal sign, just like a equals to a plus 1. The a on the left side of the equal sign is considered as a new variable name even though you already had it. 
The A on the right hand side is uh, considered as the expression. Basically, this expression is translated as we create the variable A by assigning A plus 1. In this case, we already have 3 in the variable A and we add 1 to 3 to update the variable A with 4. In other words, we replace A on the left side with 4. This expression is very useful to replace it by itself without creating a new variable when we write a code in the future. So please keep in mind. So far, we created four variables, A through D. To check what variable names has been used so far, there are a couple of different ways. First, we can simply type who, double H-O. You can see the list of variables that has been created so far. We have A through D and A and S. You can also type whose, add S at the end to check some more details including the data size, memory use, and precision. You can also check the workspace on the left side of the main window. It shows the variable names and given data. To delete the variable, you can use clear followed by the variable names that you want to delete. For example, you can clear variables A and B by typing clear space A space B. Check it in the workspace or type who. See what happened. You can also delete all the variables using clear all. There are a few things that you need to be careful about variable names. First, the variable name must not include special characters or any empty space. For example, a exclamation mark BC does not work because of exclamation mark. A space BC cannot be used because of space between A and B. 1 ABC does not work either since you cannot start with the number for the variable name. Variable names are case sensitive and ABC all lowercase is different from ABC with the uppercase A. So you need to be careful about this. To create the variable name for text, you should use single quotation mark. Your text should be enclosed by two single quotation mark. For example, you can create A underscore text for octave. Without using the single quotation mark, you will get the error. It says undefined, meaning that it considers octave as a variable name, but it has not been used before, so it gives us an error. What is a row vector? The row vector is a one-dimensional array of elements in horizontal direction or column direction. In this diagram, the row vector name is A, and each element is represented by A subscript J, where J is the index number from 1 to M. The index number should be an integer. To refer to the size of row vector, we can call 1 by M vector. 1 means a single row, and the M represents the column size. To express the row vectors in math, the square brackets are used to enclose the sets of elements with the space between elements. Similarly, a column vector is a one-dimensional array of elements in vertical direction. The indexing is also similar, and A subscript I represents the ith element of the column vector A. The column vector can be written using the square brackets with the vertical element arrangement. The size of the column vector is n by 1 vector. I will show you how to build the following 1 by 5 row vector A. A simple way to build the row vector is to use square brackets, multiple elements, and space in between. In command window, you can type A as a vector or a variable name, equal sign, square brackets, and type 3, 5, minus 2, 0, minus 1 with the space in between. If successful, it shows only elements with the variable name A without square brackets below. This approach is straightforward and works best if there are no patterns among the elements. To access to the specific element in the given row vector, you can use index within the parentheses. For example, if you need to access third item minus 2, type A parentheses 3. 3 means index number 3. It shows minus 2 as expected. If you want to access to the last element, you can use A parenthesis 5, which is minus 1. What about replacing minus 2 in the index number 3 with numeric number 2? Type A parenthesis 3 and 2. 
then you can identify the change. You can also add the element at the end. For example, you can add the minus 1 as a sixth element by typing a parenthesis 6 equal to minus 1. You can see the result. What if you try to add the element to a much larger index than column size? For example, you try to add minus 2 as a tenth index by skipping elements 7 to 9th. If elements do not exist, Octave MATLAB automatically add zero element. What about accessing to the multiple elements at the same time? For example, you can access to first and fourth elements by typing a parentheses indices 1 and 4 with the brackets. You can see the result. To replace the first and fourth elements with a 6 and minus 3, and you can type a parentheses square bracket 1 and 4 parentheses equal to square bracket with a 6 and minus 3. Then you can see the changes. What about creating a 1 by 5 row vector b having 1 to 5 with the increment of 1? You can still use a square bracket. Alternatively, in case that the elements increase by 1, you can use colon operator. The syntax j colon k generates a row vector having the first element j to k having increment of 1. You can type b equals sign starting number 1 colon followed by n number 5 to create row vector b. You can use the colon operator for indexing. For example, if you want to access to the second to fourth element, you can type b to colon 4. This approach works best if elements are considered as a series having the increment of 1. The colon operator is very important in Octave MATLAB and we will reuse it for various applications later. So please keep this in mind. What about creating a 1 by 6 row vector C having 0 to 0.5 with the increment of 0.1? You can still use square brackets, however, since the series has an increment of 0.1 rather than 1, you need to specify it. The secret is to specify the increment between columns. You can type C equal sign from 0 to 0.5 and use 0.1 between columns. What about a 1 by 5 row vector D having 5 to 1? We can consider this series as a 5 to 1 with the increment of minus 1. You can type D equal sign from 5 to 1 and use minus 1 as a increment. Sometimes we need to create a row vector having the certain number of elements from the start and end with equal spacing between the elements. For example, we would like to create a row vector between 1 and 5 with equal spacing for the different column size. You can use a built-in function lean space which represent linear space. This function requires at least two arguments. The first element j and last element k and a column size m. If you skip m, m will be 100 as a default, meaning you will generate 1 by 100 row vector. To create a 1 by 3 row vector from 1 to 5 with equal spacing, you can type f equal sign linear space 1, 5, 3. The argument 1 is a starting element, 5 is the ending element, 3 is the column size, the spacing is 2. We can also build a 1 by 5 row vector from 1 to 5 by changing 3 to 9. The spacing is 0.5. This approach works best when you know the start and the end element and desired column size for equal spacing, rather than specific increment between the elements. What about column vector? A simple way to build a column vector is to use square brackets as you have done for the row vector. However, the difference is to use semicolon as a row separator between elements. For example, I would like to build a 5 by 1 column vector G having the element 3, 5, minus 2, 0, minus 1. Type G with the square bracket and element to see given column vector. If successful, you can see the elements in a vertical direction without square brackets. Another way to create a column vector is to transpose a row vector by using single quotation mark at the end of row vector. Here, I will show you how to create 
a 5 by 1 column vector h for the element 1 through 5. In this vector, the elements increase by 1 from 1 to 5. You can simply create a row vector using column operator. Then you can use a single quotation mark to convert it to the column vector h. So in command window, you can type h 1 through 5 followed by single quotation mark. Alternatively, you can introduce the dummy variable x for the 1 through 5 row vector and then transpose it later. What is a matrix? A matrix is a two-dimensional set of elements organized into rows and columns with brackets. If you have n by m matrix, it means you have n numbers of row and then m numbers of columns. Mathematically, the matrix can be written using the square brackets with two-dimensional set of elements having space between elements both horizontally and vertically. To refer to each element in matrix, typically, we use two different subscripts. The first subscript i represents the row number, and the second subscript j represents the column number. So a subscript 1, 2 means the element in the first row and the second column. Let's talk about how to create a matrix. A simple approach is to use a square bracket. Since the matrix is 2D element arrangement, we need to use empty space as a column separator and the semicolon as a row separator. To create the matrix A, type A equals sign bracket with the elements for the first row, the 3, 5, and minus 1 followed by semicolon and continue to type the set of the element in the second row 7, 8, 5 followed by semicolon and finish the rest of them. To access the element in the matrix, you can use a parenthesis with a row and the column numbers with a comma as a separator. To access to the element in the second row and third column, you can type A parenthesis with 2, 3. You can see 5. You can also use brackets or column operators for multiple indices. For example, you can use bracket 1 and 3 to access to the first and third row to see minus 1 and 2. You can also use 1, colon 2 for the first two rows. You can use a colon only and it means it will select the entire rows. You can also use this approach for the column indices. There are a few useful built-in functions to create common matrices. The first of all, the identity matrix is a matrix having element of 1 in the diagonal position and 0 elements in the remaining. For the n by n identity matrix, you can use i function. For 3 by 3 identity matrix i, you can type i equals sign followed by i3. If you want to create a n by n matrix with all elements of 1's, you can use 1's n. If you have non-square matrix, you can use 1's n comma m. For example, b equals sign 1's 3 create a 3 by 3 matrix b with 1's. And then b equal 1's 3 comma 5 create 3 by 5 matrix B with 1's. Similarly, you can create matrix C with all the elements of zeros using zeros n or zeros n comma m. For 3 by 3, for 3 by 5, you can use zeros 3 comma 5. If you have random numbers between 0 and 1 in your matrix as shown in the slide, you can create such a matrices using rand n or rand n comma m for square or non-square matrix. For 3 by 3 matrix, you can use rand 3 or you can create 3 by 5 matrix by typing rand 3 comma 5. If you want to rearrange the elements of the existing matrix or vector, the reshape function can be used. The reshape function requires the matrix, row, and column sizes that you want to reshape. 
For example, you can create given matrix E by creating a row vector X from 1 through 12 as a dummy and then rearrange it into the 3 by 4 matrix using the reshape function. Since my elements is starting from 1 through 12 in a matrix form, I create X 1 through 12 as a row vector and then reshape them using reshape function. So I start with X and then row size 3 followed by column size 4. The total numbers of the elements of the reshaped matrix should be the same as before. You can combine existing matrices into one either column direction or row direction. To combine two existing matrices, the column or row size should be the same. I will show you how to combine matrix C and D in column or row directions. For matrix H, matrices C and D are combined in the column direction with the brackets and space between C and D. For matrix J, matrices C and D are combined in the row direction with the brackets semicolon between C and D. You can keep adding the matrices as long as they comply the size of matrices. You can check the size of matrix using size function. There are two outputs from the size function, one for row size and the other for column size. To save two outputs, I use row and column and followed by size H. Now you can see row size is 3 and column size is 10. You often need the larger dimension only between row and column and you can use a length function. So. The larger dimension of matrix H is 10. Consider the same size of matrices A and B. If you want to add matrices A and B, you can use plus sign between A and B in Octave MATLAB. Similarly, you can use minus sign between A and B if you want to subtract matrix B from A. Remember, the size of matrices A and B must be the same to add or subtract. Otherwise, it will give you an error message. The resulting matrix size is the same size of matrix A or B. Consider given two matrices A and B. I will show you how to add those matrices and save the result in the new matrix C. First, you need to create the matrices A and B. Then you can type C equals sign followed by A plus B. The resulting matrix C is shown below. The elements in the matrix C are element-wise addition between matrices A and B. What if you want to subtract matrix B from matrix A? Since we already created matrices A and B before, we can simply type C equals sign followed by A minus B. The resulting matrix C is shown below. The elements in matrix C are element-wise subtraction between matrices A and B. What if you want to add two matrices A and B having different sizes? For example, 2x2 two two matrix plus 3x3 three three matrix. Since I have the existing 3x3 three three matrix A, I will clear variable A then create a new 2x2 two two matrix A. Unless you clear the existing matrix A, it will remain a 3x3 three three matrix. When you add two matrices, you can see the error message saying that the matrix size does not match for matrix addition. For scalar multiplication, consider scalar quantity lambda and matrix A. The scalar multiplication is element-wise multiplication of scalar quantity lambda you can simply use lambda star sign and matrix A. Consider given 2 by 2 matrix A. 2 by A means that it needs to double all the elements in matrix A using scalar multiplication. To calculate 2A, you can use C equal 2 star followed by A. You can see the doubled elements in the matrix A. For matrix multiplication, consider matrices A and B. Similarly, you can use star sign between two matrices. However, in order to multiply two matrices, the column size of matrix A must be the same as the row size of matrix B. Otherwise, it will give you an error message. Let me elaborate how to check the matrix multiplication conformity. 
consider m by m matrix A and p by q matrix B. To check the conformity, you can lay out four numbers for sizes of matrices A and B in series. In this case, you have n, m, and p, and q. If the matrices A and B are conformable, m must be the same as p. The size of resulting matrix is n by q. Consider two matrices A and B. What is the matrix multiplication of A and B? To calculate the matrix multiplication, you need to create matrices A and B. Then multiply them by using star sign. You can see the result below. Question comes, what about B times A? Also, is B the same as AB? Let's find out. BA can be calculated using B star sign A. The result different from the one for A times B as expected. So the answer is no. What if we have 2 by 2 matrix A and 2 by 3 matrix B and want to calculate matrix multiplication? First of all, is it possible to calculate? The answer is yes. The column size of matrix A is 2, which is the same as the row size of matrix B. In Octave MATLAB, we create matrix B and calculate the matrix multiplication as C equal to A star sign B. What about given matrices A and B? Since the column size of A is different from the row size of B, you cannot multiply. Let's see what happens in the command window. As expected, it ends up with error, saying inner matrix dimensions must be agreed. Consider 1 by 3 row vector A, and we would like to square all the elements to create 1 by 3 row vector C. To do this, you may quickly come up with C equal A squared. However, it shows an error message, since the inner matrix dimension does not match. Column size of the first matrix A is 3, and the row size of the second matrix A is 1, which is different. The same thing happens when you use A times A. What you wanted is to do the element-wise squared in all the elements of A. For the element-wise operation, you can use period before your operator. You can also use period for division and exponentiation. So you can use A period care 2 to achieve what you need. Also, you can use period for the star sign. We have two row vectors A and B, and would like to create a row vector C by having element by element division. For example, the first element 1 half comes from 1 divided by 2, and the second element minus 1 comes from minus 1 divided by 1, and the third one is related to 2 divided by minus 1. Again, you can use period for element by element division. Consider a row vector A. If you want to transpose vector A by swapping the row and column indices, you can use the single quotation mark at the end. You first create the vector A, and then you can transpose it using single quotation mark at the end later. 2D plot is a visualizing data to understand the relationship between two variables, such as y versus x. The way to plot is to locate the data point y at given data x in y versus x plane. For example, if you want to plot x equal to 1, y equal to 2, you can locate your data at y equal to 2 at x equal to 1 as shown in the graph. Each data point can be represented by marker, and in this case, we use red solid circle. If you have a multiple data points, for example 1,2, 3,4, and 6,1, you can continue to add the data point to the graph. If you do not connect the data point with line, we call it scatter plot. If you show the data point by connecting with line, it is called a line plot. Oftentimes, you do not need to show the marker for each data point. In this section, I will walk you through how to visualize the data as a scatter plot. 
As an example, I will plot a single pair of data 1,2 as well as multiple data points 1,2, 3,4, and 6,1. To plot this data, I will use a built-in function plot. Plot function requires the individual coordinate for x and y as a single numeric number or multiple numbers as a vectors. For a single data point, you can directly use a number or a variable, and for multiple data points, you can use the same size of vectors. Now I want to plot 1,2 in y versus x plane. The first step would be to create the variable x and y for 1,2. and type plot x comma y. You can see the figure window. Unfortunately, you cannot clearly see the data point in the figure window since the plot function visualizes the data as a line plot using a default setting. Actually, you can see the data in the blue tiny point in the center of the figure, but this is not what you want to do. To change it to the scatter plot, you need to start customizing the property. You can customize a plot property such as a color, marker type, and line type, and size, etc. by adding additional arguments. The property can be changed using the combination of the single character and symbols. The possible list of the single character and symbols are given in the tables. And you can find the further information in the description below. Here, I will plot the data as a red empty circle by adding OR in the third argument. O means the empty circle as a marker, R represents the red color. It does not matter to swap the sequence, and the octave will pick up without having problems. So then I can start adding OR. Now you can see the single point scatter plot for 1,2. We'll talk about the other option for the property later. Moving on to plotting multiple data points, you need to provide the x and y coordinate as a vector. Since you have x coordinate of three data points, 1, 3, 6, and corresponding y coordinates to 4, 1, we can build my variable x as a row vector using square bracket by typing x equal to 1, 3, and 6. If you want to learn more about how to build the vectors, you can review my other tutorial video. Similarly, you can update the variable y as a row vector, so you can type y equal to 2, 4, and 1. Then type plot x, y, followed by the property. Now you can see scatter plot. Now I would like to improve the figure format by increasing the marker size, adding x label and y label, grid and title, and line size control the x and y range. First of all, I need to increase the marker size since it is too small to read clearly. We can increase the marker size to 12 point by adding another property control marker size followed by 12 for the font size. Now you can see the increased marker size in the new figure. Secondly, I would like to add the grid for the major tick on X and Y axis. The grid can be added by using grid on. Now you can see the grid on the figure. If you want to remove it, you can type grid off. Now it disappear. Now I turn back on. Next, I'd like to add the title on the top portion of the figure as a plot y versus x. We can use a title function with the title text. To use it, we can start with title single quotation plot y versus x. Now you can see the title on the top portion of the figure. To increase the text font size, you need to use set function. The set function requires the first parameter for which figure you want to control. I will use GCA for the first parameter, which means that you want to control the currently active figure. Then you can use a property name as a string followed by the property value. I will increase the font size to 24. Similarly, we can also add the X and Y label by using label functions. I would use X label 
variable x and y label variable y. Now your figure looks much better. Lastly, I would like to customize lower and upper bound on x and y axis. You can use axis function. This function requires a vector having a lower bound and upper bounds of x and y axis. The first two elements are lower and upper bounds of x axis and the last two are for the y axis. I would like to show only 0 to 7 on the x axis, 0 to 5 on the y axis. In this section, I will show you how to plot the linear and polynomial curves as a line plot. As an example, I will plot y equal to 0.5x plus 1 for x from minus 2 to 2 and add the second line plot y equal to x squared for x from 0 to 2 to the same figure window. The basic idea on the line plot is the same as a scatter plot. However, since the relation between y versus x is already known through the given functions, you can generate the data point through the given relations. Question comes how to generate the data for x and y. Typically, you can start with x data as a vector, followed by generating vector y using given relation between x and y. To plot the curve, I would like to generate the vector x from minus 2 to 2 with the enough data points. The more data points you have, the smoother curve you look. I use vectors x1 and y1 for the first curve and x2 and y2 for the second curve. I will start with 5 data points, so I use x1 equals lean space minus 2, comma 2, comma 5. And the size of x1 is 1 by 5. Then I generate the vector y1 for the y data using y1 equals 0.5 star x1 plus 1. The x and y data must be the same size vectors. Otherwise, we cannot plot due to the size mismatch. You can use built-in function length to check the size of the vector x1 and y1. Now you are ready for the data points for the plot. To plot the line curve, you can use plot x1, y1. And you can see the figure window for the straight linear curve. As a default setting, the plot function uses a blue line by connecting the data points. For demonstration purpose, I show where the data points were in the line plot by adding the markers. I add the string bo- to the property argument for both marker and blue line. To add the grid, x label, y label, and title, and the change, the font size, etc., you can use the same command as before. While you're finishing yours, I will finish mine. To add the second curve, you also need the vectors for the second vectors. Similarly, we can generate the vector x2 from 0 to 2 by using x2 equals lean space 0, 2, 5. And again, the size of x2 is a 1 by 5. I start with a small vector size on purpose to show how important the number of data points are. We can increase the number of data points later to show the smoother curve. 
To create the y data, you can use y2 equal to x2 period hat2. I just want you to highlight that you need element-wise operator period hat since GNU octave consider x square without period as a matrix multiplication. And it will end up with being error since the inner dimension does not match. In other words, 1 by 5 multiplied by 1 by 5 does not work for the matrix multiplication. All you need is to get each element squared using element-wise operation. Here, the question comes how to add the second curve. In the plot function, you can add the vectors for x and y data points with the property. Now you can add a second pair of the data right next to the first data set with the line property as plot x1, comma y1, comma bo dash, comma x2, y2, comma rx colon. You can see the second curve in the same figure. However, you can see a few kinks because you do not have enough data points, so I increase the vector size to 30. Now you can see the smoother curve. In this section, I will show you how to plot cosine x and cosine x squared with custom ticks. The ticks are the values to show the specific point on the coordinate axis. Plot function uses the numeric value for ticks as a default, but we need to customize them for some functions, like sine and cosine since we typically use multiples of pi. For the two curves, I use x1, y1 vectors for cosine x and x2, y2 vectors for cosine x squared. The x1 varies from minus 2 pi to 2 pi, while the x2 begins at minus pi and ends at 2 pi. So I use x1 equals lin space minus 2 pi to 2 pi. and x2 equals lin space minus pi to 2 pi. If you do not specify the size of vector in lin space, the default size is 100, which is good enough size to have smooth curves. I will generate y1 and y2 by using y1 equals cosine x1 and y2 equals cosine x2 squared. Now you can plot two curves in the same figure with specific line properties by using plot function. You can see that the x-axis shows the tick from minus 10 to 10 with the increment of 5. I would like to change them to minus 2 pi to 2 pi with the increment of pi between them. Next, we would like to customize the tick in x-axis. The tick means the major grid point in the figure. Customizing tick needs two steps. The first step is to specify the tick points. The second step is to customize the tick label. In this example plot, we'll control the ticks in the x-axis using the property name x tick for the tick points minus 2 pi, minus pi, 0, and pi, and 2 pi. You can see the changes on the tick in the x-axis, but the tick label shows as a number. Now you need to change the tick labels. 
To customize a tick label, you need to use the property name xticklabel followed by the label as a string. For a Greek word like pi, you can use a backslash followed by the English character for a Greek word. Here I use minus 2 pi, minus pi, 0 pi, and 2 pi. For the tick labels, since the string should be used as a different type of data structure, we need to use a curly brackets. The figure looks much better than before except the range of x-axis. I would like to limit my range of x-axis from minus 2 pi to 2 pi. Now your figure looks very good. In this tutorial video, I will show you how to write Octave and MATLAB scripts and functions. When you refer to Octave and MATLAB programming, it typically means to write scripts and functions. At the end of this video, you will learn how to get started with writing scripts and functions and running them. During this video, we will go over a few examples for scripts and functions emphasizing the difference between them. The example that I'm going to go over is to calculate the area of rectangles and the surface area of sphere and the volume, which I think you're familiar to. Scripts and functions are the collection of octave or MATLAB commands as a text files with the file extension M. M stands for MATLAB. Since this is a text file, you can write scripts and functions using basic text editor. Octave MATLAB scripts and functions are also known as M file because we use file extension M. Scripts and functions can be run by calling from command window. I'm going to show you how to do it in a minute or so. Often time we consider the scripts and function writing as Octave or MATLAB programming. Someone mentioned Octave MATLAB programming. They refer to write a scripts and functions. It seems like scripts and functions are very similar to each other. But the question is why we have a different names. I'm showing a schematic diagram for a script here. Whole small box represent collection of MATLAB Octave commands. Scripts do not need any input from user, meaning that you already define your input variables within the scripts. However, in function, we require a certain input from user so that without having input from the user, you cannot run anything. So once you receive it, now you can start calculating something and then you can spit it out as an output. Function needs input and output as a part of uh, functions, so otherwise it doesn't work. I'm going to show you the difference between these two throughout the example. In my first example, I'm going to show you how to write a script to calculate area of rectangle with x and y. As you know, the area of rectangle can be calculated by x multiplied by y. To write a script, you can use basic text editor like a notepad or some other text editor software. But MATLAB Octave also provides built-in script editor. Script editor can be found in one of the sub-window and then when you click the editor tab, you can see big blank box. So I prefer to uh, set up the window layout between the text editor and command window sitting right next to each other vertically. If you don't know how to do it, you may want to watch my other tutorial video. When you open a blank text editor, you can see blank white page. You can start writing a command. I'm going to define my width x equal to 3 and my height y equal to 5. You can define a variable a for area equal to width multiplied by height. So once you're done with the writing, you can hit save button here. Choose the folder that you want to save at and then choose M file name. For the demonstration purpose, I'm going to use area of rectangle as an M file name and hit save. So as soon as you hit save, you can see the new M file name is popping up under the file browser. 
or you can also check it under file explorer and then you can find a location that you save at and then you can find the m file that you just created so this is nothing more than a text file you can also open it with the text editor just like a notepad in order to run the script that you just created you can go to your command window and then type the m file name that you just chose which is area rectangle then you can see the a equal to 15 which is ms3 multiplied by 15. there are a couple of things that i want you to highlight so one thing is you can also make a comment right next to each line for yourself so sometimes you need to make a note for yourself so that so you can remind yourself what you have done it to make a comment what you can do you can use a percentage sign you can make any note for example in this case my x is width of rectangle as soon as you use a percentage sign, it becomes green. So meaning that Octane Math Lab ignore the text beyond my percentage sign. So you can also do the same thing for Y. So Y is height of rectangle. Then my last line, you can also do A is area of rectangle. So they can hit save and then you can run it again. In order to run the same M file, Typically, I use upper key arrow so that this will pull up the command history you just type in previously. So when you hit the enter, you can run M file easily. So under the command history, you can see what command that you punch it in. So you can click it, the command that you want it to repeat, double click, then you can run it again if you prefer to do so. And then another important thing that I want you to highlight in the workspace you can see all the variables that you've been using x and y and a then you can monitor what's going on including the value that has been assigned now if you want to change the width to 2 and then height of 6 then you can save it and then you can rerun it and end up in having different area however if you want to extend this script as a function by having the input from the users rather than using the predefined width and height you need to write function by receiving input from users which i'm going to show you right away one of the problem with script is if you wanted to change your number in the variables in this case width and height you need to go back to the script and change it and save it and run it again which is painful so i'm going to make x and y as a input variable from user so then you can call the function with the input from user you can easily calculate the area of rectangle with the different variables for width and height in this example i'm going to show you how to write a function to calculate area of rectangle by receiving width and height as an input parameter you may want to draw a block diagram to build a function by receiving x and y as an input and calculate area of rectangles. So x and y is going to be input variable, a becomes your output parameter. MATLAB Octave require a certain syntax to write a function. Very first line, you need to start with a function followed by square bracket with the variable for output. So if you have multiple outputs, you can use output 1, output 2, output 3, and output n. In the meantime, you can use a comma as a variable separator. So if you have only one output, you can skip the square bracket. Then you can use an equal sign. You can use any function name. Then you can use a parenthesis, and then you can define your input parameter. So if you have multiple input parameter, you can use uh, input 1, input 2, input 3, uh, all the way down to input n then you can use a comma as a variable separator at the very last line you can use end to finish your line but in the meantime you can write any sequence of octane method commands but important thing is that you need to build a relationship between output variable and input variable you can nicely develop a function i'm going to open the new script then start with my function followed by output parameter in this case i have only one output 
which is area, so that I start with A, followed by equal sign, then I can define my function name, so that I use fn underscore area rectangle, followed by parenthesis, so I have two input, which is x and y, so I use x comma y. For comment, I can define my A is used for the area of rectangle, and my input parameter x is the width of rectangle, y is the height of rectangle. Now I can finish my uh, function with end, but in the meantime, I can define the relationship between my output variable A versus the input. So that area can be calculated by x multiplied by y. I don't want to automatically display my area as you run the function. So that I can add a semicolon at the end. Now once you're done, you can hit save and then choose a folder that you want to save at. So in this case, I save under Mr. Stem Edu. Then I can use the same function name that I chose, which is fn underscore area react and hit save. So once you save, make sure that you create a new M file, which is function underscore area rectangle dot M. The way that you can call this function is you can go to command window and then you can define a output variable. So in this case, I'm going to use area followed by equal sign. And then you can use the same function name as you use, which is fn underscore area rectangle followed by input parameter for x. I'm going to use 3 and then 5 for y. And then close your parentheses and hit the enter. So the way that it works, 3 and 5 is going to be transferred over to my input parameter x and y. So 3 and 5 is going to be assigned on x and y. Then x and y becomes a part of the calculation, which is 3 multiplied by 5, and assign the 15 as an outcome on a. Then a is going to be returned back to in the output variable, then return back to my command window. We, you can simply visualize my input is coming as an x or y, and then do calculation x multiplied by y, and then outcome has been returned as an output. Now I'm gonna show you how to develop a function to calculate surface area of sphere and the volume of sphere. Again, I'm gonna use a similar block diagram. So my radius of R is going to be input and I have two output which is surface area A and volume of B. In the meantime, you can develop a relationship between R and A and B, A versus R and B versus R which is given in the mathematical formula here. So to develop the function, you can start with the blank page, then I can start with my function. I define my output variables. I have two output variables, so now I can use two variables, A and B, followed by equal sign. Then I can use fn underscore calculate area and volume as a function name, followed by parentheses. I have only one input parameter, R. Then I can start making a comment. So my R is the radius of sphere and then my A is the surface area of sphere my B is the volume of sphere you can finish your statement with end in the meantime you need to define the relationship between A versus R so I need to put 4 multiplied by pi r square. I also need to calculate volume b equaled 4 divided by 3 multiplied by pi multiplied by r cubed. So once you've done that, you can hit save and then use the same function name that you've been using fn underscore cal area underscore volume and hit save. Okay, make sure that you create the new M file. So once you've done that, you can call this new function by having two output. So I have area and I have volume so that you can use a square bracket followed by a function name, fun, cal, 
area and volume followed by your radius so let's say i have two then you can calculate your surface area and the volume for the radius of two so if you want you can change the number so they end up in having different outcomes so let's say i have radius of three you have different area and volume what if you wanted to call the function from different function you want to make a certain group of sequence as another function you can call from another m file for example i'm going to replace my line number five which is calculating surface area of sphere with another function so i can create a separate function to calculate area of sphere so that i can use fun area sphere Again, I, my input is a radius. So my A is the surface area of sphere. My R is the radius of sphere. Then I can finish my structure with end. Then my A is gonna be four times pi times R square. So there you can hit save. Use the same function name as you've been using underscore area sphere and save again make sure that you create the new m file then going back to your original m file which is fun cal area volume now i'm going to replace my line number five with a function so again my area is the same as of before so that i can return my a to this output variable then you can call my function, which is fn underscore area sphere, which you developed here. Then you can use the same r, which is input parameter for this function, then hit save. Again, you can go to your command window and then repeat command. You can see the same outcome as before. Idea here is that you want to call a function from another function. In summary, hope you understand better how to write scripts and functions, including the difference between them. Conditional statement is very important to understand for the logic flow control and decision making process in ActiveScript and function writings, and hope this tutorial video is useful for you. During this video, I will go over the basics of the conditional statement, the syntax of if, else if, else statement and a step-by-step -step approach to write a script to display the student letter grade by receiving the score from user. The example that I chose is to display the letter grade by receiving the overall score of the class from user. Conditional statement is a logic flow control mechanism to run the different commands depending on the logical expressions. This is a simple block diagram to visualize what the conditional statements do. Consider an input and you can evaluate a logical expression and you can control an output depending on the result of logical expression, which is true or false. Let's assume that you are an instructor who needs to assign a letter grade based on the overall score from each student. Perhaps you can quickly do it manually if you have only a few students. However, if you have hundreds of students, you may want to write a program to automatically assign the letter grade to save your time and efforts. Let's assume that you need to use the letter grade criteria given in the table. If the score is above 90, you want to assign the letter grade A, and between 80 and 90, the letter grade is B, and between 70 and 80, it should be C, below 70, it should be F. I know it is a tough grading scale, but to simplify a programming algorithm, I came up with a very tough one. You can make your own table for your project. To write an M file, I will break the process in a few different steps for you to understand the step-by-step -step approach. The first step is to receive the input from user, which is the class score. In this example, I will use a built-in function called input function. This function asks the input from the user by displaying the user-defined text. The default data type is a numeric. Here's a syntax that you need to follow. 
Start with the input followed by the user-defined text. Then you can save the data that you want to receive under the variable. As an example, you can type x equal to input, enter a value for x with a single quotation mark. And this command will ask you to provide the numeric value for x. In your example script for the letter grade assignment, I will use a user-defined text as a enter a score 0 from 100 and use the score as a variable to keep the class score. I will write a M file using the script editor and once you finish the writing the input function, you can hit the save button and create the M file name letter grade. I will save it under the Mr. Stem Edu folder and it can be different from yours. Once you run, you can see the enter a score from 0 to 100 in the command window and you can enter the score. As an example, you can type 95, hit enter. However, you do not see anything yet, since we do not make any efforts to display the contents of the score. The simple way to display the contents of the variable score is to use a printf function. You can simply type a printf. Here, I used two specifiers, percentage %d and backslash %n. The percentage %d is a specifier to display the contents of score in an integer format. And backslash n is to add a new line, basically enter. Once you run this script again, you can see the score. Now, the next step is to add the letter grade criteria. For demonstration purpose, I will further simplify the problem for the easier programming. Let's have only two letter grading scale, A or F. If the score is greater than or equal to 90, your letter grade is A, otherwise it will be F. I know it is a really tough grading scale, but let's keep it as it makes your programming easier. To write a program, you need to understand the basic syntax of the conditional statement, which is if statement. To write a if statement, you need to start with if followed by the logical expression. Then you can add single or multiple lines of MATLAB or Octib commands. And you need to wrap them up with the end at the end. The BGL logic diagram shows the conditional statement for the logic flow control depending on the value of score. If the score is a variable for the student score and the value of the score is greater than or equal to 90, we can display the letter grade A. Otherwise, you can display F grade. I know that we are missing the criteria letter grade B and C at the moment, but we'll revisit this later. To implement the grading rubric, you can start with the if followed by the logical expression. I think you want the criteria for the letter grade A from the score greater than or equal to 90. I can type if score greater than or equal to 90 and wrap up with the end statement at the end. Now, if the score is greater than or equal to 90, you want to display the letter grade is A. So you can add the app printf function in between. Once you're done, you can run the script. Now you can see the text in the input, and when I provide 95 for the score, you can see the letter grade of A. One more thing before we move on. What about providing 80, which is below 90? Let's see how your script works. When you rerun and type 80, you can see nothing, although you would like to see the letter grade F. The reason that you do not see anything is that when your score is 80, the logical statement of if statement is false. The block of the commands between if and ends are skipped, and it reaches the end of the script without doing anything else, because nothing else is given. To add the functionality to display the letter grade is F, you need to use the if else statement. The if else statement can be written by the adding else followed by the commands, 
that you want to run when the logical expression in if statement is false. In your example problem, once you put else statement, the commands under the else statement will run when your score is below 90. I will add the else followed by the printf, letter grade is f. Now, when you run with the score 80, you can see the letter grade F. The question comes, how can we add the letter grade B and C in between A and F? Before going back to M file, this is a logic block diagram again. So first, you can check the score is greater than 90 or not by using the if statement. Then you need to have another logic block diagram if the score is below 90, you can check whether the score is still greater than 80 or not by using else if statement. If the score is greater than 80, you can give him B grade, but otherwise, you need to check another criteria whether the score is greater than or equal to 70 or not. So if it is still greater than 70, you can give him C. If not, you can give him F. You can add else if between if and else statement, which we call it if else if else statement. The script will check whether if statement is true, and if it's true, it will run the command under the if statement. If not, it will check the else if statement is true or not. If it is true, it will run the command. Otherwise, it will go to the next else if statement. If none of if or else if are true, it will run the commands under else statement. You can add as many else if statement as you need, depending on the criteria. However, you need to have only one if and else statement within the same group of if, else if, else statement. To add the criteria for the letter grade B, I would add the else if score greater than or equal to 80. Perhaps you may want to explicitly define the logical statement score is between 80 and 90, but you don't have to do it. If the octave reaches 9 over 6, it means the score is already below 90, and you can check only if score is greater than or equal to 80 for the letter grade B. Similarly, you can add else if score greater than 70 or equal to 70 followed by the app printf, letter grade is C. You can save the M file and run to see if this plays the letter grade reasonably. I think you can type 85 for the score to see the letter grade B and 75 for the score to see the letter grade C. I will go over how to use a loop statements, especially for for loop in GNU Octave and MATLAB. Loop statements are very important computer languages for reading, writing, processing data by repeating sequence of commands for a given numbers of iteration and or conditions. In Octave and MATLAB, there are two particular ways to create loop statements. The first one is for loop and the other is while loop. They give you the same functionality, but one provides an easier syntax than the other, depending on what you want to do. In this video, I will focus on for loop and I will make another tutorial video for while loop in the near future. First of all, I will explain the basic syntax for the for loop. Then, I will go over a step-by-step -step script writing for the example project, which is calculating body mass index, BMI for short, from given height and body weight for five individuals. Finally, I will display the BMI categories such as underweight, normal weight, overweight, and obese for individual based on calculated BMI. I chose this project since this gives you an idea how to read, process, display the data using for loop. 
Before you learn the loop statements, the most important question is why you need to learn the loop statement. Typically, the computer reads, calculates, display one information at a time. If you have big list of data, you need to go through the data one by one, which is very time consuming. If you want to automatically go through the entire data, you may need to some computer language to handle these repeating instructions, which are loop statements. For example, if you have hundreds of students in your class to assign the letter grades based on the score for each, or millions of healthcare data for diagnostic work, the loop statements will be definitely helpful. Let's say you need to display my number is 1 through 5. You can manually display the such a series of text with the number change from 1 through 5. However, what if you need to much longer list, let's say a million lines? Perhaps you do not want to manually type such information, right? Question is how to use loop statement to finish such a job quickly. The basic idea of the for loop is to wrap the octave and method commands with the index having the row vector for iterations. The for loop needs to start with for followed by index and we need to assign a row vector for index change and number of iterations. The for loop allows for automatic change of the index one by one from the first element to last element of the row vector and the number of iteration will be the same as the length of row vector. The index should be a variable and it can be used as a part of octave MATLAB commands. Probably the simplest example would be to display the contents of a for loop index since it will directly show how the for loop works. To display the contents of the for loop index, I will wrap the formatted display function called appprintf with the for loop. To remind you of how appprintf function works, I can write a simple script. I have a variable i equal to 1. And if I want to display the variable i in an integer format along with the sum text, you can type appprintf my index i equal percentage %d backslash n followed by i. I will save the script as my for loop under the working directory. In my computer, it will be C Mr. Stem Edu, but it can be different from your computer. Once you save and run the script, you will see my index i equal to 1 in the command window. Percentage %d is a specifier with an appprintf function, and this will be replaced by the contents of the variable i and backslash n will be the enter after you display the contents of index i. Now I will use the variable i as a for loop index and display the content of the index i during the iterations. To build a for loop, I need to start with for followed by the index i equals vector minus 2, 4, and 3 with a square bracket and wrap up with end at the end. Normally, we do not use the index row vector like this, but for the demonstration purpose, we will specify the contents of the index i using square brackets. You can save and run again. And then you can see the three lines with the different contents of the index i. The basic idea here is that your index i changes from the first element to the last element as it iterates and the numbers of iterations will be the same as the length of the row vector, which is 3. Now, let's practice how to use for loop to calculate BMI for multiple individuals. Before we talk about how to use for loop in BMI calculation, let's find out what the BMI is and how to use BMI for your health monitoring. The BMI stands for Body Mass Index defined as body weight divided by the height squared. For example, one guy is 1.78 meter tall, having 68 kilogram weight. The BMI will be 68 divided by 1.78 squared, 21.5. From the BMI, you can categorize as underweight, normal weight, overweight, and obese based on the table. Since the BMI of this gentleman shows the BMI of 21.5,
its BMI is under normal weight. Now, I think you understand the BMI better than before. Then let's jump on the example problem to learn how to use for loop. Consider five individuals having height, weight, ID given in the table. I will create two variables, height and weight, for height and weight data as row vectors using the script editor in Octave and MATLAB. To work with for loop, you can use ID as an index to access to height and weight data and calculate BMI for each individual as a row vector. For example, if you want to read the height and weight of the person ID 1, you can use a BMI formula as a BMI 1 equals weight 1 divided by height 1 square. Basically, this expression provides the calculated BMI will be saved in the first element of the variable BMI. Since we need to iterate from ID 1 through 5, you can use ID as an index. To work with for loop, you can change this BMI formula to BMI i equals weight i divided by height i square with the index i. For those of who need to understand how to use the index for variables, please watch my other video about this topic. Now, you will loop the BMI calculation through the index i using for loop from the row vector from 1 through 5. We can start with the BMI formula with the index i, and then you can wrap it up with 4, followed by the index i and row vector from 1 through 5. You can also display the ID, height, weight, and BMI as you iterate using a printf function. We are using fraction numbers between percentage and specifier f, and these are the syntax to control the decimal points. I will make another tutorial video about this in the near future. Once you save and run the script, you can see the height, weight, and BMI over the three columns. Now you may want to display the BMI category under normal, overweight, and obese based on the BMI in the fourth column. First, we'll use the conditional statement to create a text for the BMI category depending on the BMI through the variable name category. Then, we can display the text given in the variable category using a printf function. For the conditional statement, I will use if, else if, else statements. For those of you who do not know how to use the if, else if, else statements, you can watch my other tutorial video. The conditional statement for the BMI category can be used right after the BMI calculation. If the BMI is below 18.5, the category text is underweight. I use the variable category followed by the underweight between the two single quotation marks. You can continue to finish the rest based on the BMI category table. Then you need to add the functionality to display the text by using the specifier percentage %s for the string display and you also need the category variable in the app printf. Once the script is saved and run, you can see what you designed for. I will show you how to use while loop in GNU Octave and MATLAB from this tutorial video. I will go over the basic syntax of while loop followed by the programming a simple countdown timer using the while loop. The while loop is very important syntax to control number repeating the blocks of Octave and MATLAB commands while a certain logical condition is met. Oftentimes, people ask what the difference between the for loop and while loop since they seem very similar. They repeat the block of octave and MATLAB commands, but the for loop would be easier to work with if you already knew how many times you need to repeat, whereas the while loop works better if you know when you need to stop looping although you don't know how many times to loop. In this video, I will focus on while loop. In case that you want to learn for loop, you may want to watch my other tutorial video. First of all, I will explain the basic syntax of the while loop. Then I will go over a step-by-step -step script writing for the example project, which programs the simple countdown timer. I chose this project since this gives you a basic idea how to control number of loop using the logical conditional statement through a simple example. Before you learn the while loop statement, the most important question is why you need to learn the while loop statement. 
In many cases, you need to control some repeating sequence of octave and method commands under a certain logical condition. Here are a few examples in daily life. For example, you develop a mobile game, and in this game, you need to a functionality to move your screen while you are touching the screen. The basic idea is that you calculate to display the moving screen only when you touch the screen. Otherwise, it stops moving on the screen. While loop is also very useful when you solve complex equations using iterative numerical method. The iterative method begins to solve the equation with an initial starting point and the solution from the previous iteration become the input of the next iteration. This iterative process continues until the algorithm finds the solution. So you can use the solution finding criteria as a logical conditional statement. Hope this example will give you a basic idea why you need to learn while loop statement. The basic idea of the while loop is to wrap octave and method commands with the index to control the logical statement. The while loop needs to start with while followed by the logical statement. Then you can add the block of octave and method commands between while and end statement to repeat. The block of octave and method commands run only if the logical statement is true, meaning that you need to make the conditional statement forced to stop the loop or to escape the loop. There are a couple of important notes. Since the while loop continues to repeat when the conditional statement is true, unless you have a certain mechanism to make the conditional statement forced, the loop never stops. Typically, when you make the conditional statement forced, you control the conditional statement through the updated index just like i equals i plus 1. In math, i equals i plus 1 does not give you a sound logic, since i cancels out to end up having 0 equal to 1, which is nonsense. However, in computer programming, this is common expression to update variable i by adding 1 at a time. Left side of i is a new variable value based on the previous i plus 1. If you want to subtract 1 from the previous variable as you run, you can use i equals i minus 1. If you want to multiply 2 on the previous i to update the variable i, you can use i equals 2 multiplied by i. I think you are ready to develop a simple countdown timer, and please keep on watching. Now, let's build a simple octave and MATLAB script for the simple countdown timer. We can set the initial time as a 5 second, and then you can count down until it reaches 0. You can start with the variable i for the initial time and countdown index. So I can start with i equal to 5. Then you need to count down from i equal to 5 by subtracting 1 as you loop. So I will add i equals i minus 1. Like I mentioned, this expression allows you to subtract 1 from previous i. So you can use this expression for the countdown timer design. Then you need to display the variable i by using a printf function. Also, you may want to add the pod function between two countdown numbers, otherwise it counts down as fast as the computer can go. In Octave and MATLAB, you can use the built-in pod function. The pod function at the end second pod before it runs the next commands. And I will add the one pod by using pod one. Then you can wrap this block of the Octave and MATLAB commands with the while loop. Remember, you want to count down until it reaches 0 starting from 5. You can work with while i greater than minus 1 and finish your while loop statement with end. You can save the script with a countdown timer. countdowntimer.m and you can run to see the countdown timer starting from 5 to 0 in the command window. Thanks for watching this video and
and please subscribe my channel if you want to continue to watch tutorial videos in science, technology, engineering, and math. Please give thumbs up if you enjoyed. Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. See you next time.